welcome to Miracles in the Book of Acts with Dr. Peter McLuhan. Our topic today is Miracles in a Roman Fort. In last week's program, we followed Paul and his team as they traveled from Miletus back to Jerusalem. Along the way, Paul received prophetic words about trouble awaiting him in Jerusalem. Now, the reaction of some was to beg Paul not to go to Jerusalem, but Paul was certain that he had an important task to do in the city that only he could do. Looking back, we can see that the purpose of this prophecy was not to stop Paul from going to Jerusalem, but rather to strengthen Paul for the task ahead of him and to stir up the church to pray fervently for him. In Jerusalem, Paul was gladly received by James, the brother of Jesus and the church elders. Luke says, after greeting them, Paul related one by one the things that God had done amongst the Gentiles through his ministry, Acts 21, verse 17. Paul was excited about reporting on his third journey to the West. More and greater miracles happened on this trip than on the previous two. Paul shared about all the extraordinary miracles in Ephesus and the boy who died who was raised back to life in the city of Troas. Now, following this happy report, the situation for Paul in Jerusalem became very dangerous. And without God's miraculous intervention, Paul would have been killed. He was accused of bringing Gentile followers of Jesus into the temple. And after that, false accusations against Paul began to mount. He was accused of defiling the temple, and that was grounds for killing him. And the disturbance came to the attention of the tribune on duty, and he ordered the soldiers to run into the mob trying to kill Paul and bring him into the safety of the fortress. And when he reached the stairs leading to the fortress, Paul asked the tribune for permission to speak to the leaders. Now, Paul was the most qualified person to address the religious leaders in the temple. He was the highest educated Pharisee. He held the highest rank among them. Now, the tribune reluctantly gave him permission to speak, and Paul addressed the leaders in the Hebrew language, and for a while they listened, but soon the crowd turned against him. Again, the tribune needed to take Paul into the fortress for his protection. Today, we'll hear about miracles that happened in the fortress. The tribune intended to flog Paul to try to find out why the Jews were so angry at him. Now, Paul wisely invoked his rights as a Roman citizen by asking the centurion who was standing by him, is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? Acts chapter 22 and verse 25. Paul was immediately released by the tribune who said, I bought my citizenship for a large sum, to which Paul replied, but I am a citizen by birth. Acts 22 verse 28. From this moment on, Paul was treated with the highest level of respect by the Roman legal system in Judea. The door was now open for Paul to share his faith with anyone who spoke to him in the fortress. Luke wrote, the next day, desiring to know the real reason why Paul was being accused by the Jews, the tribune commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. Acts 22, verse 30. This is exactly the miracle that Paul had prayed for. He wanted an opportunity to speak directly to the chief priests and to the council. The council was comprised of 13 elite leaders who had authority over all the religious affairs of Judaism. They were the Jewish Supreme Court whom Rome had allowed to exercise authority in all cases except the death penalty. Paul was the only follower of Jesus who was respected enough to address this group. 
And Paul identified himself as the son of a Pharisee, the grandson of a Pharisee, and a student of Gamaliel. He was bold enough to address the council as brothers. Paul viewed them as peers and not as superiors. And Paul immediately got to the heart of the message of Jesus by simply saying, it is with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial today, Acts 23, verse 6. The only message Paul wanted to present to the council is that God raised Jesus from the dead. The previous day, Paul had shared his personal testimony about meeting Jesus face to face. and Paul was the most credible witness to present this evidence to the council. Immediately, the council was divided. This is because the Sadducees did not believe in life after death, but the Pharisees did. Luke wrote, then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel did speak to him? Acts 23 and verse 9. The Pharisees believed in angels and life after death. They were very close to entering the kingdom of God. Maybe you believe in angels and life after death. Your next step is to ask God to open your eyes to see who Jesus is. Paul might have hoped that the Sadducees would have asked him some good follow-up questions about his encounter with Jesus, but their minds were already so hardened they could not accept the fact that Jesus was alive. Once again, Paul needed to be rescued by the tribune. This is another miracle of protection that kept Paul alive. The following night, the Lord stood by Paul and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Acts 23, verse 11. And Jesus himself confirmed to Paul that he wanted him to witness to the council in Jerusalem. And Jesus also announced that Paul must stand before Caesar in Rome and testify that Jesus was raised from the dead by God himself. Now, this is the third of four times that Jesus appeared to Paul at critical moments in his ministry. We heard about the first one last week when Jesus stood by Paul, giving him clear instructions to leave Jerusalem back in Acts chapter 9. The second appearance was when Jesus stood before Paul in Corinth to break his fear. He said, do not be afraid. I have many people in the city. Paul needed this word from Jesus because the Jews were plotting to kill him before he could leave Jerusalem again. This is how it happened. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves together by an oath neither to eat food nor drink until they had killed Paul. And there were more than 40 who made this conspiracy, Acts 23, verse 12. Then they presented their plan to the council. We have strictly bound ourselves, they said, by an oath to taste no food until we have killed Paul. And they asked the council to request the tribune for another opportunity to cross-examine Paul. They said, then while Paul was making his way into the council, they were ready to kill him before he comes near, Acts 23, verse 15. But God had other plans that no one could stop. And no one can stop the plans that God has for you. God always has people in high places who can protect his servants and open doors at the right time. I pray that God opens the right doors for you at the right time for the message you share to get to the people whom God wants to hear. Now for the first time in the New Testament, we learn that Paul had a sister who lived in Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Uh, through her father and grandfather and her brother Paul, 
she was still connected to the highest religious leaders in Jerusalem. Luke says that her son heard of their ambush, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Acts 23, verse 16. No doubt the children of the highest leaders played together, and someone let the news, someone let the secret plan out about the plan to kill Paul. The young man must have loved his Uncle Paul and reported to him what he had heard. Luke says, Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune. He has something to tell him. Acts 23, verse 17. The centurion took Paul's nephew to the tribune, and in a rare glimpse into the tribune's heart, Luke wrote, The tribune took him by the hand, and going alongside, asked him privately, what is it that you have to tell me? Acts 23, verse 19. The boy said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow. Do not be persuaded for them, uh, by them, for more than 40 of their men are laying in ambush for him and have bound themselves by an oath to not eat or drink until they've killed him. Acts 23. 20 and 21. The tribune believed Paul's nephew and ordered the boy not to tell anyone what he, that he had shared this information with him. The tribune immediately put together a plan to protect Paul. He ordered two centurions to get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen and go as far as Caesarea in the third hour of the night, Acts 23, 23. Paul himself was provided with a horse for the journey and for his protection. So by 9 p.m. the very same night, Paul was escorted out of Jerusalem, heading to Caesarea, guarded by no less than 470 soldiers. And so the night Jesus had promised Paul he would preach in Rome, he showed Paul that he was fully capable of making sure that Paul gets to Rome safely. Overnight, the soldiers escorted Paul to the town of Antipatris. This is about 37 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Antipatris was, uh, re, had been rebuilt by Herod the Great on the ruins of ancient Aphek, the border town between Judea and Samaria. And the next day, they moved on to Caesarea, where Paul was presented to Felix, the governor of Judea, with a, a letter written by Lysias, the tribune in Jerusalem. Acts 23, verse 22. So Luke finally gives us the name of this kind and insightful tribune whom God used to miraculously protect Paul. Paul received no less than five miracles while he was in the custody of the soldiers at the fortress of Antonio. Paul received a clear vision that his final witness would indeed be in Rome itself. Now he still has many years of productive ministry. The next chapter of his life is about to unfold in the town of Caesarea, where he'll be held as a prisoner for two years. And these will not be wasted years. He will witness to three of the highest Roman officials in the region. I pray that God brings miracles into your life through the hands of unusual people to help you fulfill the plans that God has for you. If you are in a difficult situation, I pray that Jesus visits you and gives you clear direction to show you your future. Paul's message is that God raised Jesus from the dead. We invite you to ask Jesus to save you and fill you with his Holy Spirit. Write to me and tell me what God has done for you. Next week, we'll continue studying miracles in the book of Acts. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk with someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. 
We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as $1 a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations to Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.